This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, you have once again found the Human Action Podcast, and we're so glad that you've joined us. And as a reminder, you know, the purpose behind this podcast is to get people going to original sources. So many of us are sort of consuming information and news and social media, and we're listening to Jordan Peterson or somebody like that tell us about Kant. Well, why not go read Kant? And and when it comes to Austrian economics, we want you to do the same thing. We want you to check out the original works of Mises, of Menger, of Hayek, of Rothbard. And that's really what this podcast is all about. So we're hoping that we whet your appetite for some of these books. And People who have been listening the last few weeks know that we have gotten into some of the more obscure, perhaps underappreciated books by Mises, uh, some of his smaller books like Bureaucracy, uh, The Anti-Capitalistic Mentality, The Ultimate Foundation of Economic Science. These are, these are shorter, more discreet reads. So if you're not quite ready to tackle human action and spend the next you know, 10 months of your, of your life by your bedside uh, read, you know, reading six pages of human action every day, you, you can read Mises and some of his smaller works, and, and that'll give you a tremendous taste for him. And so we hope you do that. Of course, if you go to our bookstore at Mises.org, type, use the code H-A-P-O-D, that's for Human Action Podcast, H-A-P-O-D, you'll get a discount on any of the books that we're talking about. So use that code, get the book, and of course, all these books are also available for free online at Mises.org if you want to read them in PDF form or whatever. But today, we're joined by a friend of ours, Matt McCaffrey. Matt is a former senior fellow here at the Mises Institute. Uh, he is also a professor in the UK at the University of Manchester. He uh, got his PhD in economics from Guido Holzman at the University of Angers in France. And he also spent some time in Auburn uh, getting his master's in economics uh, from the program here at Auburn University. So he's someone we've known for a long time. And uh, it's so great to talk to you, Matt. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Well, omnipotent um, government. I mean, what a book. First of all, let's set some context. Uh, 1944, although he actually started writing it much earlier in, in 38, it's the same year that he releases Bureaucracy. So Yale University Press, a very mainstream publishing house, releases both Omnipotent Government and Bureaucracy that year. Also the same year is Road to Serfdom by Friedrich Hayek. So a, a big year. And and of course, what's what's really different, Matt, now in, in, the, in the late 30s versus, let's say, when he wrote... Um, nation, state, and economy in the late teens is that we've got World War II. We've got the Nazis. We have his experiences first go- fleeing to Switzerland and then a couple years after he starts writing this book to America. So that's really the backdrop against which this book is written. Yeah, that's correct. And in, in a way, it's not an exaggeration to say that Mises had you know, almost a, a lifetime's worth of experiences between writing these two books, Nation, State, and Economy, and an Omnipotent Government, uh, experience on which he was able to to draw in, in writing the second book, because as you say, uh, his whole life really had been uh, taken away from him, uh, what with the rise of, uh, of Nazi power and eventually uh, fleeing to first to Switzerland and then to the United States. So it, it's an extraordinary year for publishing, so to speak, as you pointed out, um, but also uh, a very uh, significant one for Mises as well, you know, uh, because by this point he had was uh, firmly established in the United States and was beginning to try and uh, put the pieces of his life back together again and to, uh, to make a fresh start. Um, and to that end was writing books like Bureaucracy and Omnipotent Government um, that he had been thinking about for a number of years uh, as a way to uh, once more, like he did at the end of the First World War, summarize all of the, the, the economic and the ideological conditions that had uh, led to that particular moment uh, in his life and, and also much more broadly in, in world history. So he was setting him up, himself up with a, a task that I think was really important for him personally, uh, but also very important ideologically and economically to sort of explain some of these, these broader trends um, that had been uh, dominating world affairs for the, the, the previous few decades. But when you say putting his life back together, I mean, we're talking about also his career and his own personal finances. This is a, a gentleman who's now, uh, you know, older – 
He's in a new country, a new language, without a lot of great uh, career prospects and without a lot of money. I mean, these aren't pop books he's writing, uh, to put it mildly. Oh, there yeah, that, that's absolutely the case. And I mean, of course, I, the most significant example of this uh, relates to Mises uh, developing uh, the Human Action, which was published uh, a few years later in 1949. Um, but these smaller books are, are no less examples, in a way, of the, the the fact that even though he was at an advanced age at that point in his life, uh, he really was still thinking in very serious terms about the development of his economic ideas and the development of his own uh, version of, of liberalism and trying to use these to make sense of all of the, the chaotic events around him in the world. So it, unlike some other writers, it's not as if in his old age, he sort of drifted away from doing serious work uh, to doing maybe more popular writing or something like that. Uh, he did a little bit of that in the United States, of course, uh, but the, the bulk of his time was still spent in developing some very serious economic uh, and philosophical ideas. So in that sense, it is some of these books are, are really tremendous achievements in the sense that he already was at a, at a fairly advanced age uh, when he had had to just discard his entire life up to that point uh, and move to a totally new country where he didn't have uh, any friends or allies and where he was really just starting from scratch. Well, one thing about this book is he really shows his chops as an historian. I mean, the original working title was in, in the late 1930s was The Way of the German People Toward National Socialism. So this book is very much a historical account of what he calls the fall of German liberalism. Uh, he, in other words, he, he writes a lot about Germany in all of his books. He, he really knows the history of, of old Germany, of uh, German nobility. Uh, th this, is a, this is a historical work. Th that's correct. Um, and it's in understanding it, I think it's important to acknowledge that it is a work of history as opposed to, say, a comprehensive treatise on economic theory or something in the vein of human action or of socialism or theory of money and credit. Like nation state and economy, omnipotent government is a much more specific kind of study. And as you say, this one focuses on Germany. Uh, a good deal of nation state and economy had addressed uh, the former Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, but now in you know, omnipotent government, Mises is, is very much focused on Germany and in explaining basically the rise of Nazi power. So um, the focus is is much more explicit. Uh, but as you say, he does really demonstrate that he had uh, read quite widely on a a, a pretty uh, extraordinary range of historical topics relating to. Germany. Uh, and you can see that he's very much engaged with um, as much literature as he could be uh, regarding German history and sort of uh, the uh, sociology of the German intellectuals and so on. Um, and not just from friendly writers like other liberals, um, but also from many socialists, many Marxist writers as well. Um, he, he displays a, a really wonderful command of, uh, of, of quite a few literatures in that respect. So it's another small way in which I think the book is impressive. You know, we see these quotes from Mises really throughout his whole career, but but again in this book, he, he goes back to this idea that we have to understand history. If we don't understand history in context, we, we really don't understand not just the economic ills, but the political and social ills of our day. And, and it's in a sense, it's depressing, Matt, because you know, so many of the, the errors we read about in this book are being repeated ad nauseum today, for example. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's it's sort of a uh, a cliche uh, when reading a historical book like this to say, and you know, we see parallels to what's going on in the world around us. But in this case, it really is true, nonetheless. Mises uh, is is very much uh, analyzing a lot of the same kind of ideological trends, a lot of the same kind of economic errors uh, that uh, that we see coming back again and again in history, um, and in particular in the last few years in different forms, particularly the ideas relating to um, uh, nationalism, um, to economic nationalism specifically, but also the other branches uh, of nationalism and its sort of other ideological implications. Um, the not, uh, you know, for instance, the, the Nazis' views about uh, all kinds of, of problems relating to things like race and language and nationality and so forth. Mises unpacks all of those uh, 
sometimes in great detail. And the more he does so, the more you start to, to hear those echoes um, from all kinds of other events and, you know, and, and pundits around us today. Yeah, it's interesting, is that this is probably his lengthiest and deepest treatment of the Nazis. And it would be, I'd like some of his critics who call him a neoliberal or whatever they call him today, I'd like some of his critics maybe on the left to, to have a look at, at the particular section about, about National Socialism in Germany, and, and they might uh, disabuse themselves that, that he was some sort of right-winger uh, or in, in any way uh, you know, providing economic cover for, for Nazism. He's quite the opposite, in fact. And, and one thing I'd like to point out is that he really takes pains at the beginning of this book to, to make a distinction between etatism, statism, and nationalism. So why don't we, why don't we start there? Because there, with Mises, we always got to understand our terms and our definitions. So talk about what he sees as the difference between statism, you know, the total state, and nationalism. So one of the key themes of this book is uh, the the rise of what Mises calls etatism, um, or perhaps statism. Uh, Mises has kind of a funny footnote where he says he doesn't like the then newly coined term statism because he thinks it's it's too narrow in some historical respects. But uh, the the theme of the book is uh, this etatism um, and the rise of, as the subtitle says, the total state and total war, and. One of the things that Mises does in the book is look at the different branches of etatism um, and the different ways that it manifests. And so there's an interesting sort of um, uh, family tree um, of these different ideologies. So for, for Mises, starting with etatism, which is the belief in what could ultimately be called omnipotent government, that is a, um, a state, an all-embracing state uh, with near absolute power uh, over its region, uh, over its uh, particular geographical area, um, and the belief in the state as sort of the solution of all social and economic issues. Um, this sort of very broad view gives birth to a number of different variations. And for me, it's the two uh, real branches of, of etatism are socialism on the one hand uh, and interventionism on the other. Uh, and he has a good deal of discussion in this book and then later in Human Action as well about exactly what the differences between socialism and interventionism are and uh, sort of how they manifest in reality. Um, but for, for both of these, um, uh, related to both of these, is the question of nationalism. And uh, for, uh, for Mises, with interventionism in particular, there is a very close relationship with nationalism because uh, uh, interventionism tends to breed, uh, according to Mises, nationalist attitudes, um, and then nationalist attitudes then sort of feed back into economic policy and help promote uh, further interventionism. So for Mises, uh, nationalism in, in this sort of broad sense is the elevation of one's nation over uh, the interests of one's nation over the interests uh, of other nations, and particularly this attitude of uh, the idea of conflict between nations, the idea that to advance one's own interests or the interests of one's own social group uh, requires uh, doing damage to the interests of other social groups or other nations or what have you. So um, for me, this, this, this specific idea of conflict among nations is at the, the basis of what he calls uh, nationalism. Um, and this, as I said, um, is sort of uh, a necessary implication of interventionism. And that relationship is one of the themes that he really develops throughout the whole book. So our listeners will understand what he means by socialism. And many of them have read the book. We covered the book earlier. So he's, he's already given a very thorough account of what his conception of socialism is. But when he uses the term interventionism... He describes it as a third way or a halfway measure between capitalism and socialism. We've we've heard the term over the years like mixed economy. Do do you think this? Do you think his definition of interventionism and and the distinction between interventionism and full socialism, and interventionism and full capitalism? I, I, do you think that's basically correct? Do you think it's it holds up today? Yes, I, I think it's useful, and particularly. The definition of interventionism is one that I think will seem familiar to anybody who looks at current economic relations and economic policy, uh, because for Mises, the interventionist society, 
is one in which many, uh, where nominally and, and on paper, uh, a lot of the market economy is preserved, or, se or seems to be at least, uh, whereas the, the reality is that there is a significant degree of government control over the economy, over decisions about what entrepreneurs should, be, uh, should produce and when and where and how and so forth. So it involves a lot of the same practical effects as socialism, uh, but very often uh, maintains at least this sort of veneer of private property and the division of labor and, and, and the market economy. So that I think is much more familiar to us today uh, than say a strict definition of socialism as Mises employs it, which is involves state ownership of the means of production, uh, which is a situation that is extremely rare. You know, it, um, it's actually fairly rare just in history in general, um, but especially today, there aren't very many places that could uh, be deemed to fit under this definition of socialism, whereas practically all countries in one way or another uh, fall under his definition of interventionism. So it's, it's one, it's a distinction that I think is, is useful to make, and it helps us avoid falling into uh, rhetorical traps where, uh, you know, we begin to, to sort of um, describe everything um, as socialism that involves some kind of hampering of the market economy. Uh, so it, it, it's good to, to be careful with our language and having a notion like interventionism, I think, helps us do that. But Matt, the problem is, as libertarians, we fall into this trap of saying, you know, that's not real capitalism. Just like the, the, this, the lefties fall into the trap of saying, oh, Venezuela is not real socialism. So, so if most countries actually aren't at either, you know, this pole of pure capitalism and this pole of pure actual state ownership, uh, most countries, including the United States, which is considered this hyper-capitalist bastion, if most countries, uh, you know, have, lie somewhere in between in what Mises would, would call interventionism, um, I'm not sure our friends on the left are buying it when we say, no, 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 that's not real capitalism. It's never been tried. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's a, it's a very real and an, and an important problem that we currently face. And <clears throat> as a way to answer it, one important thing that I think libertarians don't do enough is admit that maybe some of our pet cases and pet examples uh, aren't actually as as good as we might like them to be. Um, you know, we like to, to look around us and, and point to, uh, you know, um, our newest phones and say, hey, look, the wonders of capitalism right there. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe that's not the best example. Maybe we can't always justify using these kinds of examples, or we should at least be a little more careful about how we how we use them. Um, because it is very easy to fall into this, this trap of, uh, well, so-called uh, vulgar libertarianism, constantly pointing to everything that you like and saying, oh, look, the benefits of capitalism and then pointing to everything that you hate and saying, oh, look, the problems of socialism. So I do think this is a problem. And I know my approach is, is less uh, popular, uh, but I, I really do think that we should uh, take more care with how we use these things. Now, of course, one perfectly valid uh, point that uh, defenders of capitalism will bring up is that um, even a little bit uh, uh, of the market economy um, has been proven so many times to so effectively improve standards of living and and you know our, our general human welfare. Whereas time and time again, only a little bit of socialism has proved so disastrous for human life and welfare. So that is a, a a perfectly reasonable objection when it comes to this issue of saying, oh, well, it's never really been tried. Um, so I, it, that's important to work out as well. Um, but overall, um, once again, I, I tend to be a, a stickler for, for insisting that we should be as careful with our, uh, um, our examples um, as we possibly can be so that we can avoid being caught out in some kind of trap where people say, aha, you know, you, know, you say that uh, this latest innovation is, is proof of the, the efficacy of free markets, but you admit that we don't have free markets. So how could you possibly make that argument? Um, it, it's important to be as careful as possible to avoid those kind of traps. Well, so Mises also gets almost a, a little bogged down here uh, in this idea of nationalism versus nationality. And he talks about this actually at some length in liberalism, uh, a, a couple of decades or 15 years earlier, 
But he, he c- comes back again and again to this idea of linguistic groups, and he's, this seems to be a, a bit of a hang-up for him. And do you think this is just because he's coming out of the patchwork of principalities and, and the Austro-Hungarian um, Empire and, and, and what Europe in the, even in the 1800s looked like, which was recent memory for him? Uh, you know, because this seems to not matter very much in the West today. No one really, you know, a lot of people speak Spanish in America. It's, in the U.S., South, it's or Southwest it doesn't really matter, uh, but but so talk about you know nationalism and nationality and and his idea that that linguistic groups will will conflict with each other if they're sort of uh, yoked together in an artificial nation. Okay, so this is this is one more uh, very important theme for Mises in this book, as you point out. Um, but to get at it, um, I would go back to something that we were discussing just a, a moment ago when we were saying that. Unlike Mises' comprehensive theoretical works, this is a very specific historical study. And just like in Nation State and Economy, where Mises was trying to explain the economic and the ideological conditions that led to the First World War, and so ended up explaining quite a few issues that were specific to the former Austro-Hungarian Empire, in this book, Mises is doing a very similar thing uh, with the Nazis and with World War II and with uh, the the German speaking world essentially, so it rather than provide a, a, a sort of general theoretical account of of the state and of war and so forth, Mises is is being pretty specific, and so that's the reason why he talks about a lot of these issues relating to things like language and language groups is because they were a very specific part of the explanation of the rise of. Nazi ideology, and then more broadly, nationalist ideology. So that's why Mises talks about this. Uh, you know, he makes a very interesting comments in Omnipotent Government about um, the importance of, of language and of, of language groups. And in particular, he's focused on sort of the, um, what, what I'll call the uh, uh, kind of obsession with language groups and with defining nations as groups of, of common language speakers. So in you know, omnipotent government, Mises is very critical of this idea. Um, this for him was what is behind a lot of the, uh, the, the German, the Nazi view of how to distinguish between different peoples and different races. Um, the, the language one um, is Mises, he calls it arbitrary, um, but he points out that it, it was used quite commonly by the Germans, by the Nazis um, to distinguish uh, the people that they wanted to include in their own nation versus the people that they wanted to uh, to exclude. So it's all part and parcel of explaining this much broader problem of the uh, the emergence of nationalism, the emergence of uh, of ideology. Uh, but Mises is pretty critical of this notion of of defining nations based on uh, on common language groups, and he's emphatic that um, the problems of having groups of uh, within a particular uh, nation uh, of of different language speakers has a lot to do with the institutional setup, and it has a lot to do has a lot to do with these questions about how we uh, resolve conflicts um, and how we make choices about things like what languages are taught in schools, what languages are used in the press. For me, this, these are the fundamental questions uh, about language that are very important. And as he points out, if you have um, different language groups within a particular state, uh, it inevitably leads to a, a kind of conflict because inevitably there will be minorities who speak a different language who will be discriminated against. Um, and so um, uh, Mises bring, mentions a series of examples, um, but a lot of the peoples of the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire um, and of the various areas that uh, the Nazis conquered um, would fall into this category. Um, so again, this is one of the, in terms of economic policy, this is one of those broader themes that are informing what Mises is trying to say about this big, bigger question of uh, where Nazi ideology came from in the first place. Sure. And, and I would say, well, in general, I think we would all agree that Europe is is much better off today in terms of these suspicious or cloistered groups or linguistic conflict. But the, some of the problems he identified, as you say specifically, I mean, they did still crop up uh, later in the 20th century. We can look at for, the former Yugoslavia, for example. I mean, there's still frictions here that I think he correctly identifies. And I, I, but I think he, but I think, you know, his prescription for these frictions is not bellicose nationalism. <laughs> 
Of course, of course, his prescription is is you know is, is equality before the law and not discriminating against these different groups. But uh, a part of making that argument is is him also pointing out that it's really impossible to define nations adequately based on this sort of common language being spoken. Um, as he says, that's, that's an arbitrary way of distinguishing, and it's a way of thinking about the problem that was only ever really embraced by this one part of Europe. Um, he provides a number of examples from uh, around the world um, of countries or nations, um, linguistic groups that never thought of the nationality principle in this exact way. Um, so once more, he's trying to get at some, some of these very specific tensions and also point out about how they how they relate to political institutions and how they relate to economic policy um, because for him a lot of these problems emerge when you try to uh, force different potentially uh, uh, different groups together under the law um, for me is this you know as a, as a liberal he didn't believe that there were any inherent tensions between say different language groups but for him the policies of interventionism uh, are, are what create conflicts what create a kind of a, a class war based on things like language distinctions and so that's something that he was very very critical of well another thing this book gives us is a a fairly robust sense of, of Misesian free trade arguments. Protectionism is a big theme throughout this book, which he views as a symptom of aggressive nationalism. And there is this German concept of course, this Nazi concept of Lebensraum, this settler colonialism, where you don't go out and get resources through trade, you get resources through conquest, in effect, and that uh, the German people ought to have some form of autarky. They ought to have enough resources, and if that, re if that requires annexing a few nearby countries, so be it. They ought to have enough resources to be this uh, autarky. And so, so talk about his, his you know, protectionism as a theme in this book. Yeah, so protectionism is, in a way, the bridge between a lot of these different concepts and a lot of these different attempts to organize the economy in different ways, particularly along some the lines of some kind of state planning, because it's always protectionism for Mises that, uh, that incentivizes and that, that institutionalizes all of these different problems, um, whether it's um, you know, sort of uh, mercantilist ideas that, uh, you know, we um, lead to restrictive protectionist trade policies that hurt one country and damage another or then and, and, you know, and help minorities in another country. Um, whatever the exact connection is, the theme is always the same, which is that it's protectionism that creates conflict between different groups, whether it's uh, domestic or international. And it's it's protectionism that set the, sets the stage and incentivizes all different types of, of political conflict, ultimately leading to war. So for me, this uh, protectionism and the rejection of, of laissez-faire and of laissez-passe, that, that is behind um, these much broader ideological movements that inevitably led to the rise of Nazi power and then the Second World War. So for me, this, the, the connection is, is always there. Um, you can always find some kind of protectionism lurking beneath the surface that is actually motivating these other uh, seemingly different types uh, of ideological changes. Well, so protectionism is, is perhaps a nasty uh, uh, or, or a subtle form of war, but then there's outright war too. And Mises talks about this. He uses this expression total war. And by this, he means war between peoples as opposed to the more limited wars uh, of armies between armies uh, in a monarchical era. So, so on the one hand, he's identifying democracy and liberalism as, as avenues towards a freer and better and more prosperous society. But he also identifies that uh, under so-called democracy, under modern nation states, w war has actually become more total than, than perhaps it was when someone didn't care, as he puts it, if, if they were ruled by the Habsburgs or the Bourbons. Right. Well, I think Mises's view of democracy here would allow him to say that uh, it was not, in fact, democratic states that that produced total war, but states that were essentially 
interventionists that, that had been thoroughly co-opted by nationalist ideology and that had done away with all but maybe a few uh, sort of nominal elements of, of democracy. The, that was his view of the situation, at least. Uh, Mises was convinced that uh, uh, a sort of minimal state form of, of democratic government was the only political option going forward. Um, and as he does point out, uh, which I think is perfectly true, uh, when you look at the a lot of the major combatants uh, in, in World War II, um, they either didn't have very strong democratic elements or they abandoned them very quickly uh, once the, the, the going got tough and adopted some type of system of, of war planning that enabled them to move towards total war, the, the total subservience of the economic system to the war planning effort. Now, you know, as libertarians looking at the problem today, we might disagree a bit with uh, how Mises characterizes democratic decision making. Uh, but nevertheless, I think from within his own viewpoint, um, I think he was consistent in saying that um, really it wasn't the, the democratic uh, process that was that resulted in total war, but rather this thoroughgoing nationalism um, integrated with uh, domestic and then international interventionism. <laughs> but Matt, let's be fair a little bit. I mean, this is literally a man of old Europe, a man born in the 1880s. So he, he didn't have all of our century and a half uh, to, be, to get a little more jaded about democracy. It was still sort of a new concept. Uh, dem democratic voting, or at least mass democratic voting, coming out of coming out of the, the all the uh, duchies and and feudal uh, you know parts of old Europe. Yeah, that's sort of my point. Is that uh, for Mises, he was looking at things from the perspective of essentially a sort of a nineteenth century uh, liberal who was very interested in um, getting rid of you know the the older monarchical, very hierarchical forms of government and replacing them with some type of self-determination. Self-determination obviously is a very key concept in, in Mises' liberalism. Um, so I, I do think that um, had he lived a little bit longer, um, I think he would have become a good deal more uh, cynical about uh, democratic governments. But that's that's not really sort of, I, I would say, his, his point in, in omnipotent government. Um, what he really means, what matters, I think, most for this discussion is that what he was really getting at was self-determination um, as a principle. So, again, obviously, you know, contemporary libertarians could argue that dem democratic forms of government are not true self-determination. Um, but for me, this, that was the, the central issue. So um, I would say that that would probably have been less important um, for, for yeah. him writing this book. Yeah. And again, we have a, a lot more hindsight. Than he had writing, and in the forty or the thirties. Yeah, yeah, we we've seen a lot of things um, that uh, that Mises uh, didn't know about, or that that couldn't have anticipated. He couldn't have anticipated. In fact, I think if you look at the, the last part of this book a little bit, when Mises talks about sort of the future um, and what will come after the Second World War, um, you can see that in some ways, you know, he he really um, uh, he he didn't quite. He didn't get it right. You know, he did not all of his predictions about the kind of institutions that would arise after the war was over uh, came true. And there were some things that he I think he didn't um, uh, predict quite accurately, such as, for example, um, the, the complete sort of collapse of uh, formal Nazi ideology after the war. Um, I think Mises, if you look at those last chapters, was convinced that like after the First World War, um, there was going to be this. Um, sort of Nazi party in hiding that was just waiting to start World War III as soon as it got half a chance. Uh, but I think he was ended up being mistaken about that. Um, so yes, long story short, we do have hindsight and we do we are able to see things um, that, uh, that Mises wasn't able to at the time. Well, also, he's writing this book without the certainty of the outcome of the war. I, again, he starts writing this in 1938. And there's a few uh, references to what he calls this new war. <laughs> so he, he doesn't know that the Nazis are going to lose. He doesn't know what's going to happen in, in, in France. He's not, he doesn't know what's going to happen in the South Pacific. Right, you're right. You can definitely see that parts of the book were written at, at different times. Um, and some of them are, I think, a little more confident that the material that he was, that he was finishing at the end of 1943 uh, or maybe the beginning of 1944 – um, 
he, I think there's some passages where he is a little more confident um, and he seems to think that the, the destruction of the, the Third Reich is inevitable at that point um, because the fortunes of the war had taken a, a better turn for the Allies than it did in the, the early years. Uh, but you, you're, nevertheless, you're, you're correct. I mean, there is this degree of uncertainty uh, in, in what Mises is, is writing and also especially the uncertainty about exactly what the end of the war would look like, whether it would involve a negotiated peace um, or as became you know, increasingly likely as the war uh, wore on, uh, the, the, the total military destruction of the, the Third Reich. I think Mises couldn't quite see that um, when he was writing this book. He couldn't quite predict that that was the way it was going to go. Well, he has a, an interesting section towards the end of the book called Delusions of World Planning. And in this section, he talks about, for instance, global trade agreements. He talks about concepts of world government, world trade authorities. And I have to say, maybe he doesn't completely contradict some of the things he said on that same topic in liberalism, but he sure sounds less enthusiastic about the prospects for some sort of international cooperation when it comes to either to trade protectionism or preventing wars. He, he, he sounds a little uh, dubious, let's say. Yeah, in the early days, especially in the early interwar period, I think he was a lot more hopeful about the possibilities for the success of an organization like the League of Nations. Uh, or for you know various kind of uh, uh, trade agreements between countries that would sort of safeguard laissez-faire and laissez-passer and enable nations to deal more peacefully with each other. Definitely, um, by the time World War II rolls around, um, he was a lot more uh, disillusioned about the possibility of, say, international organizations or trade agreements or what have you to really achieve lasting peace. And I think the reason for that, which is discussed elsewhere in omnipotent government, is that he had, uh, in the meantime, thought a lot more about these larger ideological issues. So something that comes up again and again toward the end of, of omnipotent government um, is this question about uh, what to do when people emphatically reject liberalism, no matter what arguments you use, no matter what evidence they see, when they just cling to etatism or to, to nationalism, um, and just in the face of, of all the evidence to the contrary, to suggesting that those are not uh, methods of, of political or economic organization that actually improve human well-being, that they destroy those things. What do you do in this case? Um, and I think Mises was finding himself a little bit frustrated over this issue uh, because he recognized that ideological change and the rejection of protectionism, nationalism, and ultimately statism was the only way forward for people. Uh, but nevertheless, he recognized that th that was not the situation that existed in the world around him. So he sort of, I think, uh, struggles through uh, discussing various alternative options um, that would hopefully keep the peace and, and prevent World War III, even in a world of, of statism. So I think that's the central problem that he was struggling with as he was writing those last sections and trying to come up with a, a plan for the future. But Matt, you know what I love about reading Mises is, is that you and I can have this conversation in, in relative comfort, but this is not an ivory tower guy. This is a guy who suffered personally because of illiberalism. He's not writing this in a vacuum. He had to flee his home country. He, he had some of his possessions dispossessed by the Nazis. He has to come to America with, with very little money, uh, very few teaching prospects. I mean, he, he's not writing this from an ivory tower at all. No, no. As you say, he, he had a lot of practical experience. And, you know, even in the interwar period, when he was working at the Chamber of Commerce in Vienna, uh, he was dealing with in, in practice with a lot of the people whose arguments he would later criticize, uh, whether they were politicians or economists or uh, um, the, the socialists of the chair, um, as he likes to call them, the, those uh, those uh, socialist and nationalist intellectuals uh, from the major German and Austrian universities. These were people that he was dealing with uh, on a daily basis for a, a large part of his at life. And in a sense, in that sense, he really was an insider. Um, he wasn't looking at it, say, from um, um, the perspective that we do today, um, not only with the knowledge of history, but, you know, with a, a good deal of, of distance from these events. Now, he was very much a, a part of those events himself. 
Um, you know, he witnessed all of this firsthand. Um, and one interesting uh, theme along those lines um, that he doesn't really discuss in a lot of his other writings, uh, maybe it was too personal or something like that, um, but in Omnipotent Government, he spends uh, an entire uh, chapter discussing a, a wide range of issues relating to things like uh, the anti-Semitism of the Nazis, which is something that I think would have hit very, very close to, to home uh, for him uh, being Jewish. Um, but um, this is this one case where he, I think he had a lot of firsthand experience because he'd seen this himself. Um, but he wasn't looking at it from the perspective of a, of a detached academic who was just trying to, to understand what was going on in some very distant part of the world. Well, and, and as you mentioned, he actually has a chapter in this book discussing anti-Semitism, and he goes back to the Great War, to World War One, in which, of course, he he fought as a as a an Austro-Hungarian officer and an, an artillery officer. So he says that, you know, a lot of German nationalism is based or coming out of World War I was based on this myth of German military superiority. So once the German citizenry found out that wasn't true towards the end of the war, and then, of course, the, the Versailles Treaty, which Germans uh, found humiliating, um, that, that, that Jewishness and Jews emerged as a scapegoat. Something had to explain, you know, why they lost and that some of the the Nazi uh, anti-Semitism has its roots in this need to explain World War One. Yeah, it's a very interesting discussion in the book um, when he told when he talks about this. Um, it's interesting that he traces the roots of the ideology of the Nazis further back in time and says that it was actually consistent with a lot of the nationalist sentiment that and the militarist sentiment that had existed in Germany prior to the First World War, uh, going all the way back, you know, to uh, to the the 1870s and even even earlier. Um, but then, as yes, as you point out, he he uh, pinpoints this moment when Germany suffers a, a crushing defeat in the First World War, and suddenly this whole mythology of German military superiority comes crashing down, and. Uh, everyone is looking for a scapegoat. Everyone's looking for an excuse to explain how, well, the Germans hadn't really lost. Uh, they were winning or they were about to achieve total victory. Um, but then they were they suffered this uh, so-called uh, stab in the back. Um, and here, sadly, this is where uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Jewish scapegoat uh, comes from um, and how a big part of how this mythology was built up. Um, as Mises chronicles in some of his historical reflections, of course, anti-Semitism was nothing new in Germany or in Europe. Uh, but World War I and the defeat of Germany in that war created a necessity to identify some group, some interest uh, who could be blamed for this. Um, and as Mises points out, because of some um, historical conditions, uh, it was it became very, very easy for that group to be the Jews. Um, and so this ended up uh, obviously having a, a tremendous impact on the way Germany developed in the interwar period and, of course, in Nazi ideology. In fact, Mises identifies one of the, the key distinguishing components of Nazism versus other types of nationalism or versus sort of fascism more broadly as anti-Semitism. Um, so for him, I think it played a, a very crucial role. And it, so it's interesting to see him discuss this uh, in Omnipotent Government, because as I said, he doesn't really talk about it a lot in his other writings, even though it must surely have been a very personal uh, and an important topic for him. Well, he also brings up the inability of German nobility to serve as any kind of bulwark. They actually succumb to Nazism. He talks about 1933 in particular, and, and he contrasts this with uh, aristocratic classes in, in other countries like England, for example, where uh, nobility had more success in business, in, in military uh, uh, strategy, in being officers, in, in, in being statesmen. So he, he basically characterizes German nobility as weak and malleable and in, in part responsible for not standing up to, to Hitler. That, that's absolutely correct. And, you know, he traces all of this back to the, you know, the mid 19th century and the rise of liberalism and the desire of the then ruling classes to do anything they could to fight liberalism, to fight the principle of self-determination, retain their power. And as he chronicles through a series of historical periods, uh, what the older aristocracy did was essentially look for any uh, and every excuse that they could to uh, prevent 
the, the realization of, of liberal principles in German politics. And it was this that led to a lot of the, the rise of Etatism and then of the particularly nationalist version of this uh, that became so prominent in Germany. And then eventually over time, because of the First World War and other reasons, morphed into Nazism. So this is part of this, this much uh, larger um, process that Mises is identifying. And, and later, uh, as you said, in the interwar period, um, a lot of these older groups, the older political parties, were just completely unable to do anything to stop uh, uh, the rise of Nazism. Uh, Mises actually has an interesting passage where he, he says, you know, right now, during the war, everyone is asking, how could it have been the case that, that Nazism just triumphed overnight? Um, did everyone just suddenly change their opinions? Um, and his answer is, no, they didn't, because people had already been imbued with much of Nazi ideology because of the, the earlier rise of nationalist sentiment and the obsession with protectionism, uh, the obsession with, the, as you say, the, the Lebensraum, the idea that Germany must expand and conquer if it's to obtain the resources it needs to survive. As Mises points out, a lot of this goes fairly far back um, in history, um, and the Nazis were able to harness that. and um, and combine it with things like myths about uh, uh, anti-Semitism in order to create their own unique brand of, of nationalism and, uh, and of fascism. And it's this uh, that uh, ultimately the other parties and the other political forces in Germany weren't able to stop because people, in a sense, already agreed with a lot of basic Nazi ideas. And the other parties, as Mises emphasizes repeatedly, they didn't have an alternative program. They didn't have an explanation. The Nazis did. It was a completely false explanation. They had a totally bogus, you know, ideology and, uh, and ideas, as well as ideas about economic policy. But they had something to offer, which none of the other groups in Germany did. Um, and as a result of that, they, there's another reason why they were just completely utter failures in terms of stopping the spread of Nazism. So when you read this book, as with, let's say, the theory of money and credit, sometimes you read a sentence and you say, wow, you know, that sentence could apply today. That sentence fits perfectly with the current political situation, the current economic situation, whatever it might be. Uh, you know, give us your pitch. What's, what's Matt McCaffrey's pitch for why somebody should read this book in 2019? Why is it relevant today? Well, I think it's relevant because it gets most at a lot of the core ideas that drive political ideology even to this day. Uh, and you will, if you read Omnipotent Government, you will see many references to the right, to the left, uh, that will strike you as being very, very similar to what you see today. So it, it's, it's um, but it's especially about these, um, uh, with Mises, uh, the, a lot of the interesting material is in the, the broader, implications of economic ideas. Because for Mises, these are, in a sense, uh, I don't want to say the driving force of history, that sounds too much like Marx, but um, they are very, very important for explaining historical events, uh, the, the economic ideology. And so if you look at some of the ideas that Mises discusses in this book, ideas about um, the, you know, the, the liberal, the rejection of the liberal notion of the, uh, of the harmony of interest between peoples, um, the rejection of that idea and embracing an idea of in, inevitable conflicts between peoples or between different groups or races or what have you. Um, you look at a broad idea like that and what Mises says about some of its historical origins and you begin to, to, to see parallels between that and other ideas today, whether they're from the left or from the right, um, you know, notions about dividing people, uh, um, you know, whether it's by language or by race or by some cultural characteristic, dividing different groups and then developing an ideology of conflict between them to explain why they must be at war with each other and why we must use protectionist economic policy or something else to um, uh, enhance our own interests at the expense of these other groups with which we're locked um, in an inevitable battle to the death. Um, these kind of very broad ideas uh, are, are still very much at play uh, in the world today. And so I think if you read a book like Omnipotent Government, you will begin uh, to see this and to be able to draw some of these interesting parallels and understand that, sadly, there really isn't anything new uh, under the sun. 
uh, both the right and the left uh, love their ideologies of conflict, um, and they are united in a sense in their rejection of some of these liberal principles on which Mises based uh, his life's work, such as the idea that we do have a, a, a harmony of interests, and that it really is uh, each to our, to, our, to our own benefit, um, as well as to the benefit of others in the world, to uh, organize under peaceful social cooperation. Um, and what Mises emphasizes is really the international division of labor uh, and the market economy. Well, Matt, I want to wrap this up with a really interesting anecdote for some of our listeners. And and I had to actually jar your memory a little bit this morning. But so your grandfather, the late Neil McEvery Jr., was, of course, uh, the, the head uh, publisher and owner of Arlington House Books, which at one point employed Lou Rockwell. And Lou uh, served in, in part as one of Mises' editors there. So in 1969, 25 years after this book came out, originally published by Yale University Press, Arlington House published it. So you have a, you have a family connection to this book. In fact, the, the copy I'm holding here that used to belong to Bettina Graves was actually a, an Arlington House copy. So, you know, you're, what, do you, what do you think of that? And well, what do you know of, of your grandfather in Arlington House, a very important man, by the way? Yeah, well, my, my grandfather was, uh, I think, in his own way, very influential in publishing in um, the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and uh, and, and so on. Um, he was uh, friends with and acquainted with a lot of people sort of in and around the libertarian movement. He, he wasn't a libertarian himself, really. He was more sort of a an old right conservative type, uh, but he had some libertarian sympathies, and those, amongst other things, uh, were what led him to take an interest in uh, Mises's work and to encourage the republication uh, of several of, of Mises's books. Um, and he was also friends uh, with uh, people like uh, Murray Rothbard. In fact, they uh, they ended up uh, passing away within a relatively short time of each other. Um, so he, he uh, was someone I, I really only knew as a child because um, uh, I was about uh, 10 years old when he, when he passed away. But um, he had, I think, a, a very positive influence on, on economics and on sort of contemporary liberalism or libertarianism um, through some of his, his republishing efforts. Um, and so um, for that, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, I at least am, am very grateful for that um, because he was one of those people, those relatively few people um, who kept the, uh, the Mises banner flying in some of those dark years when there, there weren't a lot of people around who supported Mises or his ideas or who were willing to republish some of his books like that. So um, I at least am very grateful to him uh, for, for that. Well, and and we'll finish on that note. And also, let's remember that uh, you never know the seeds we plant today in people's heads, like Neil McCaffrey Jr. was planting back in the 50s and 60s, may bear fruit, you know, half a century from now in ways we can't know. So it really is to his credit that he kept the flame of Mises alive during those years where uh, when Mises first came to America. So Matt McCaffrey, I want to thank you for your time. And ladies and gentlemen, I want you to to encourage you to check out this book for free, Omnipotent Government, at our website, Mises.org, or go to our bookstore, enter the code H-A-P-O-D for Human Action Podcast, and get a copy of it very, very cheap. So, Matt, great to talk to you, and thanks a million. Great. Thank you very much. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.